We're here talking to Julian Nitzberg about Hassel Atkins. Good morning. Julian, how did you come to meet Hassel Atkins? Um, I had been planning to do this documentary on Daniel Johnson. I was a fan of both him and Hassel and living in eastern Kentucky in Appalachia, working at a place called Apple Shop. And um, wanted to, was first going to do Daniel Johnston, and then at that point he, uh, right the week before I was about to go, he got in a fight in the mental asylum with someone and got visitors banned from him. So uh decided to pick someone more stable. So we called Hassel Atkins. Well, actually, I didn't call Hassel Atkins because he had no phone and no way to get in touch with him. So um, I was going to Charleston, West Virginia to uh, do uh, work on a documentary about uh, pollution and uh, actually pollution um, in Appalachia. They have a, um, they had a, uh, the nice people at Union Carbide had the same plant they had in Bhopal, India that just killed thousands of people. Of course, they had one just like in West Virginia that no one was talking about. Um, and decided to stop in Madison, West Virginia to try and find Hassel. Of course, we had no idea how to find him. We go to uh, the, uh, the, the post office, and we get to the post office, and we start asking the guy, like, how do we find Hassel? And he lived so far back, the remotest holler, it, that no one even knew where, how to get there. And the guy knew Hassel, but didn't know how to get him. And for some reason, one of my crew guys just kept talking to the post office guy for the longest time, and I was starting to get antsy. He'd be like, okay, we wasted our time. We're not going to find Hassel. And, uh, and then suddenly the post office guy goes, oh my God, look, there's Hassel checking his mail. And Hassel had just come in and with some lady friend of his, and we caught him, and he made us buy a bunch of records from him at an exceedingly high price, and um, arranged to come back and talk to him. Um, Julian, you mentioned the other night that Hassel tried to kill you. What's the story on that? Um, well, basically, when I was doing the documentary, out of my own pocket mostly, every time we'd hang out, I would buy him food, coffee, cigarettes, whatever he needed. Um, I'd arranged a gig for him in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so I drove from where I live, Whitesburg, Kentucky, four hours to get Hassel. Picked him up because he wouldn't drive to his own gigs, of course, um, with his friend Karen Canterbury. Um, gets gets in the fight in, the, in my movie. Drove four hours to Louisville. We're running late. I'm running, driving 100 miles an hour the whole time. He's totally laughing, having a great time. He does the gig. Now, the thing about Hassel is he was manic depressive. And when he was a young man, he could stay up for seven days in a row, sleep four hours, and be fine for another week. Um, as he got older, he was in his 50s when I did the documentary. He couldn't do that. So he had unfortunately quit drinking when I first met him and started to coffee. And so um, he would, uh, he was, you know, didn't do speed, luckily, but did the equivalent with coffee. You drink 40 cups of coffee a day and just stay up for days on coffee buzzes. And he'd basically been up for days on end. Um, while he was up, he wouldn't let me sleep either. So, And I'm not a manic depressive or a speed freak. So after all, I was so tired. And after this gig in Louisville that went really well, we drove back to where we were staying in Louisville to where we were supposed to sleep. And I was so tired, I parked my car with all the equipment in, in the trunk, like $200,000 worth of equipment. Um, woke up the next morning, the car was stolen. Called the police, turned out I was so tired, I parked in someone's driveway. I like just so tired, in the driveway, didn't even notice there was a driveway. I had to pay for getting the car out of tow yard, I had to pay all these crazy Louisville like rip-off charges, get back in the car, with Hassel, Karen, drive back to Whitesburg to drop my equipment off before we go back to Hassel's where I'm supposed to fly with him to New York. The documentary was supposed to actually be me, him, going to New York, uh, watching him do shows in New York, watching him record a new record. We get to Whitesburg, I have no money. I say, hey, Karen, could Hassel pay for his own chicken? And we stopped at a chicken place. And you know how much he loved chicken. and. 
he fucking suddenly freaked out. He decided that I was ripping him off, um, that I was making millions of dollars, that I'd, um, that at the club, I'd taken more than half the money because he did a count. I counted the amount of people in the audience and that money wasn't right. You were stealing from me, weren't you? You got that money. And I know you're making lots of money on this movie, which, you know, you make a lot of money in documentaries, so everyone knows. It's, um, I wish the documentary had been able to follow Hassel around to different cities because I really liked the contrast between how here in West Virginia, no one really appreciated him. They just, you know, saw him as the local guy who'd just been playing since 1956 and whose music they didn't think was genius or anything, you know. His gigs here really would have 20 people and then he would go to a major city and there'd be hundreds of fans and I really thought that was an interesting thing, just the difference between how people in Boone County and West Virginia had no appreciation at all of him and how people in New York and stuff, you know, for a number of reasons, but they got him. They got what he was about. They got his weirdness and loved it. So, um, And then he proceeded to ask me to uh, drive him back home and because uh, he was in my car and that was a four-hour drive but we start driving and suddenly Hassel goes you're driving too fast and I'm like eh. once again I did not take a camera out at this point a lot of people ask me that but Hassel always carried a gun with him as he told me so when Hassel who's a lot bigger than me is threatening me to kill me you don't take a camera out and you're scared shitless so we get in the, the, the my 67 vehicle Electra and we start driving and he starts freaking out about how fast I'm driving. And he starts going, you know, I was in an accident, which of course was in 1956. He makes me slow down. First I slow down to 45. He goes, no, still scare me. Slow down more, 35 miles per hour. I'm driving on the highway, 35 miles per hour. Every car is passing me. Never a police car comes by. We finally make it back to his house. And I'm just shaking. I'm like, I gotta get, <laughs> what do I do? I got to get out of here. And he goes, wait here a second. I got to get something for my house. And I'm sure he's just getting his gun, like a really good gun to kill me with. And he goes in the house, he comes back, and he basically tells me he'll never see me again. And I drive off totally freaked out. He ended up quitting, not going to New York. He quit his record label because they were ripping him off. He wouldn't do shows at the clubs because the clubs were ripping him off. But a year and a half later, he calmed down and let me finish the documentary. And luckily, he started back to drinking. And that, that had a positive effect on his personality. Any really interesting hassle girlfriend stories? Um... The weirdest hassle girlfriend thing was when I took him to this gig in Louisville, this woman showed up. Um, once again, hassle was in his late 50s, and this woman was like mid 20s. And she'd never heard his music before. She read an article that a friend of mine named Chip Nold wrote in the Louisville Courier Journal about the gig. And um, she came to the gig, ended up going back with us to a friend of mine's house where we were staying, staying up all night with hassle. The week after I um, he threatened to kill me, she started visiting Hassel in the holler. Um, and turned out she was this super rich girl from Louisville. She was a classical music student. She knew nothing about rock and roll. And apparently, this was kind of in the dead time when me and Hassel weren't talking. They fell in love. She spent all this time with him. And they started talking about getting married. And apparently, um, her parents were so freaked out that she, this rich classical music girl, had fallen in love with a uh, rockabilly musician missing most of his teeth, um, that her parents hired a private detective to do all this research into Hassel, which of course um, made her realize that he had multiple criminal convictions for a number of violent crimes. And um, for some odd reason, that changed her feelings about Hassel, and she broke up with him.